seven churches of Asia. How many churches were, uh, did the Lord ha not have anything bad to say? Two, two okay. Uh, which two were they? Smyrna and, e and who? Uh, Philadelphia. One way to remember that is, as far as I know, um, I know there's a Smyrna, Tennessee outside of Nashville, and there's a Philadelphia, Mississippi. Oh, there's a bigger one, but anyway. <laughs> there is a Philadelphia, Mississippi. Um, so I'm, I've never heard of a Thyatira or a Sardis or Laodicea. So if you're wondering which two that was six months from now, just go with the ones who, uh, there are some, some cities with that name in the United States. So uh, Smyrna and Philadelphia. Uh, Smyrna uh, was about 35 miles north west, I guess, of Ephesus, pretty much north, we'll call it, of Ephesus, 35. Ephesus was about 65 from the Isle of Patmos. And as we mentioned on this loop, if you will, that the Lord takes us on the seven churches, that was also the mail loop, the mail route, a couple hundred miles, somewhere, somewhere like that. Uh, Bronica's daddy used to deliver mail on a horse back in the 30s and 40s. And um, so, you know, you can walk, you can ride a horse, you can do all kinds of things to deliver mail. Uh, Smyrna was about 100,000 people, give or take a little bit. Uh, it was built by one of Alexander the Great's uh, generals, uh, Lysimachus, uh, in the third century. Um, it had a theater like most of the Roman uh, cities, provinces of about 20,000 people could, could, could um, assemble there for various events. Um, it was one of the more prosperous cities uh, in, in all of Asia, Asia Minor, if you will. And it's interesting, too, that, an oh, by the way kind of thing, that there was a historian, you probably heard of him, his name was Polycarp. <clears throat> he knew the Apostle John, the last apostle uh, that was standing. Polycarp was uh, later in the, er, in the first century, early in the first century, he was one of the elders at the church at Smyrna, which I find interesting. Polycarp, you can, he's a very interesting man. You can read some of his works uh, if, if you have, are inclined to do so. So this, this was Smyrna. Um, what I thought we would do, since there's only a, a very few verses, is that we would read. I would have somebody to do it, but since it's, we don't have a microphone, it's a little bit difficult. And since I have it here, I guess I can read it. Uh, starting in verse 8, chapter 2 and verse 8, maybe five or six verses. Uh, and to the angel of the church at, in Smyrna write, these things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days or a short period of time, is if what that 10 means there, just a short period of time, relatively speaking. Be faithful unto death, and I will give to you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Uh, we'll, we'll, toward the end of the class, we'll talk about what that second death means. Um, if there's a second death, what does that imply? It must be a first death. He talks about the second resurrection, which implies there must be a first resurrection. So we'll touch on that uh, at, the, at the end of class. Um, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, he says, the first and the last. Now, first of all, who is this talking again? I forgot already. Christ. Christ says, the first and the last. The first and the, what, what do you think that means? Gary, first and last. Jesus says, I'm the first and the last. Yeah, I think of the I am. I don't know if that's accurate. That's what I hear in the way I am. Okay. Uh, that, that, that is true. 
Um, first born of the dead, first to be resurrected, never to die again. Never to die again, okay. And what, is that, what, is, what, what hope does that give us, Gary? We also should be resurrected to live again. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, turn to Colossians chapter uh, 1. We'll elaborate a little bit on what Gary was saying here. Uh, Colossians is filled with this about Jesus and all that he is and all that he's done and all that he will do. We'll start with actually with verse 15. He, talking about Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, in him all things consist, while we're there, 18, and he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. Now we can also go back to John 1 and verse 1, right, where it, Jesus was there from the beginning, and, and he created, um, he says here, the things that we see, the things that we don't see, the first and the last. And that, what's another phrase that uh, the Revelation writer says as we get toward the end of the book? Alpha. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The first letter in the Greek, the last letter in the Greek, uh, that, that's, that's Jesus. So uh, Jesus is saying here that... Um, uh, these things says the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the creator. Does, does that carry some import? It certainly does, doesn't it? He has every right to say what he says. And um, so, so that's Jesus. Questions or comments on that? He was dead, and now he's alive. Hope for you and me. For sure, because we're going to die. Uh, as we all know, uh, Vera Price, a young girl, a young lady in her 30s, died this past week at, I think, 30s, probably late 30s. Uh, what did I say? Oh, I'm sorry, not, not Vera. Uh, my, my, I'm sorry. Uh, Shelly, her sister, who we all know, Shelly was a member here at one point. She suffered with cancer for over 20 years, and she died. Um, her dad died about nine or ten months ago. So they, the Prices and the Greeleys and all, they've had a tough time. So Shelly Price. So we're going to die, but is there hope for us? Is there not? There absolutely is. Jesus showed us the way. He was resurrected never to die again. And that's our hope, isn't it? That's our hope. He says, I, I know your works. What does that imply again? Does he say that with every single church? Yes. Yes. I know your works. I know your works. Your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. You are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Turn to Romans 2, 28 and 29. Romans 2, 28 and 29. Romans 2, 28 and 29. Paul talks about... Um, Physical Jews versus the uh, spiritual Jews. Verse 28, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor uh, is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision that is of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Um, are members of his church spiritual Jews? We are. We absolutely are. That's what Roman writer says in chapter 2. So he says, there are outward Jews. What were the Jews? Uh, were there Jews and Gentiles in the church at Smyrna? There were. There, there were both. So they were being persecuted not only by the Romans and by the Gentiles, but they were being persecuted by their, their fellow man. They're, they're brothers, so to speak, from a, a, a physical perspective. And he said, I know that there are Jews who, who are persecuting you, but they're really not Jews. 
they're not spiritual Jews, they're physical Jews. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Smyrna is, was a very rich city, one of the richest, maybe the richest in all of Asia. But it says that you are poor physically, but you are rich spiritually. How does that, how does that happen? How are they poor uh, physically? Well, what might be some things that were going on there? Um, That, that's true. They were suffering uh, financially because they were not going along with the crowd and with, um, um, with, with what the, the powers that be were, 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 uh, were saying. Uh, look at 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 2. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 2. I think sometimes um, you can have too many notes. I have pages of notes and I've got scribbling all over it. And you get up here and you go, Wait a minute, where was I on all of my notes? So I think you're better off just to stay with an outline. Um, Paul says in, in the 2 Corinthians 8, we'll start with verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. So... This was Macedonia. The Macedonian area was a very rich area, but spiritually, for Christians, they were poor. They were relatively poor. They were being persecuted. Uh, if they didn't pinch um, incense and say that Caesar is God or that Caesar is Lord was the actual words that they used, then you were discriminated against. You didn't have a union card, if you were, because they pulled that. You, you could not be a... Uh, uh, conduct commerce during that time, unless it was, you know, maybe behind scenes or something like that. It, isn't that how it is today? Whenever the economy is doing well, whenever people are doing well, aren't they the furthest away from God, usually, if you're a worldly person? Uh, Lance had mentioned that, say that one more time, Lance. I, mean, I think you're 100% right. I just want to make sure I say it right. Are you saying that riches can draw you away from God? They can. They absolutely can. They can. Because God, what do I need God for? Look where I'm living. Look at everything I've got. Uh, there, uh, what, what happened to the Laodiceans in that area? They were very, very rich. Well, how were they spiritually? Uh, they, they, weren't, they weren't good at all. Uh, and the Lord condemned them for that. Um, who does a gospel call? Somebody turn, I'm going to let you do it anyway, because uh, we can cover a little bit more ground. James 2 and verse 5. Somebody turn to James 2 and verse 5. I'll ask you to read a little bit loudly, if you would. We just did uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 2. So James 2 and verse 5. Gary, you have a real loud voice. If you, if you would do that. The gospel calls the, calls the poor, Paul said. When I was in Sierra Leone, uh, one of the elders there, he also preaches some too. His name's Theophilus Cartouche. Theophilus uh, called one afternoon while we were having a break before we start our night teaching. He was sitting there and he said, uh, Mitch, he said, um, you can see how poor we are here. You know, the restrooms were the streets. I mean, it, it, very, very poor. Water, you had to go and, you know, we, we've talked about all that before. He said, I know our lives are never going to change physically. The country is too corrupt, um, and we're never going to have anything here. But I tell you what we have, and it's all we've got, and it's enough, is Jesus. Um, sometimes we can be blinded, as Lance said, by, by what we have, and we forget uh, the important things in life. Because how much are you going to leave? You're going to leave it all. You're going to leave it all one day. Um, so the poor are, are more receptive to the gospel, it appears. Now, 
uh, there are rich. He said not many rich are called, which implies there are some rich that, that, that can do it, but generally, but generally not. Now, in verse, uh, that James chapter 2 and verse 5, what were they rich in, Gary? You remember what, what, the, what did they say? But you are rich faith. in faith. You're rich in faith. You don't have any money, but you're rich in faith. Uh, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 17 says, we are rich in blessings, in spiritual blessings and physical blessings as well. The, the, the Lord takes care of his own. Um, how, was, how were the Christians in Smyrna, how were they tested? Tested by what? Tested by pillow fights? Tested by what? By prison, what else? How was metal tested during those times? Well, today too, yeah, uh, fire. They were tested by fire, and it says some of you are gonna be thrown into prison, and you'll be tested and you'll have tribulation for a short period of time, relatively speaking, 10 days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you uh, the crown of life. Uh, history says that they were, they were killed, some of them. Uh, they were imprisoned, some of them. We see that in, in, in several of the churches. And um, we're not there yet, but could it happen? Yes, it could. As Don mentioned this morning in his sermon, maybe we won't be put to death. Maybe we won't be thrown into prison. The odds are we could. Uh, but but how, how are we persecuted? And as Don mentioned, are we persecuted enough? If you're not being persecuted, what might that imply? Lance? Well, when, when you talk, ask the question about how are we persecuted, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think of, um, gosh, uh, Lot. I think of Lot. And even in Sodom and Gomorrah, he was tormented daily because of the evil around him. And, and there's certain things I like. And, I mean, growing up with superheroes and stuff, I really like that. But as far as the TV show's representation and drama and stuff, I can't even hardly watch the things that I like Um, that, that, that's, that's absolutely true, and uh, Lance mentioned uh, for the video, uh, Lot, it said that it vexed his righteous soul. Lot was living in Sodom and Gomorrah, but yet he was faithful, it appears. Um, so that, that could be a form, of, certainly a form of, uh, of worry that we have to live in this. Uh, you, we're of the world, uh, we're, I'm sorry, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. I said that backwards for the record, uh, uh, Gary. Thing, when Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, I believe part of that is mourning the, the sin around you. The, mm -hmm. the Christian type of stuff. That's a good point. The emperor Diocletian is quoted as saying this from Josephus. I will eliminate the name Christian from the Roman Empire. I will eliminate even the name of Christian from the Roman Empire. Do you think they had it tough? They're almost saying that today? Almost? No, they're saying it. They're, not maybe not out loud, but that, that, that's, that's the road we're on. That's the road we're on. Um, Jesus goes on to say that I will give you the crown. The word crown here uh, uh, is Stephanos, and it denotes the victor's crown. You, you won. They won. We win. We get the Stephanos. We, we, we get the crown. It's a, it, they would give those for if you were uh, victorious in the games or contest. Now, uh, what does that imply? We, we, uh, you can look up, I was looking up the word metonymy uh, the other day, and metonymy, the crown is symbolic of the thing that it represents. That's metonymy. So what does, what does the crown symbolize, if you will? Maybe that's a better way to say it. Running the race. You, were, you ran the race, not only ran it, you won it. You won it. It, I think it's, that's your reward. That's your prize. Jesus said, if you stay faithful to death, 
you'll get the prize. You'll get the reward, even though it may cost you your life. And it's certainly going to cost you persecution. You're going to be persecuted. You are. Um, it's just, just the way it is. Uh, it's the way it should be anyway. Uh, look over in Revelation uh, 17, verses 8 through 12. I know we're going to get there, but I think this applies. Revelation 17, 8 through 12. I don't know if I want to read all of that or not, but um, you know what? Oh, he talks about your names in the book of life. I won't read all of the, uh, the beast coming up out of the abyss. We'll, uh, Sean will talk about all that. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life. From the foundation of the world, and he goes on to say, so uh, the faithful are going to receive the crown, it's their prize, it's their reward for being persecuted and even put to death, and their names will be written in the book of life. And the question is, is your name in the book of life today? Is it written in the book of life? That's mirror time. That's when you look in the mirror to see if you're doing what you need to be doing. Paul said in Philippians 3, verses 13 through 16, Forgetting those things that are behind and press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of, of God in Christ Jesus. Um, how long, according to um, uh, verse 11, do, do we have to run this race? I'm kind of tired of running the race. Well, don't get tired. You run it your whole, your whole life. You have to run it your whole life. There's no retirement. You run it. Paul says, I forget the things that are behind, and I press toward the mark of the prize for the prize of the high calling in Jesus. Now, I've got, got some questions on the last few minutes of, let me ask this. Are there questions before I move on, before I get to my questions? Okay. Um, We've touched on this a little bit already, but so this, this first one won't take too long. Jesus describes, is, John described Jesus as the first and the last. Why would this be an encouraging giving John's prophecy for the church? In other words, he said, some of you are gonna die. I've already died and I was resurrected. I overcame it. So can you, so can you, so can you. Touched on this one a little bit. Why probably, what probably contributed to the tribulation and poverty of the saints in Smyrna? Touched on that. Gary missed a couple things. Uh, Lance mentioned a couple of things that they were not going along with the program and they were excluded from um, ways to make a living. Probably that's correct. How could the church be called rich? Now think about it. You said you're poor. Everybody around you is rich but you're poor physically, but you're rich in other ways. Now, give me some ways that we can be rich. Treasures in heaven. Treasures in heaven. Uh, go to 1 Timothy 6. I'll give you a little bit of a jump. 1 Timothy 6, verses 17 through 19. They're all listed there together. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to, joy, to enjoy. Now notice, let them do good that they may rich, be rich in good works. Notice, ready to give, willing to share, Storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So it says, how can we be rich? Be rich in good works. Someone mentioned that. Be rich in good works. I thought we were saved by grace and not by works. That's not Bible, is it? We are saved by grace. 
Grace is God doing something for us that we could not do for ourselves. That's grace. And there's nothing, there's no amount of works we could have done to merit that, but he expects us to do good works after that. Yes, ma'am. That's a good one. That's a good one, isn't it? We talked about that with, with the church at Ephesus. Rich in love for each other and also for, uh, for Jesus and for, and for his Father and for the Spirit. So rich in love. It says ready to give and willing to share. You have to ask yourselves, is this for you? Is this all about you? Are you willing to part with some of your physical things to help others? Some are, some are not. Might want to look in the mirror on that one. Greg and Don. Excellent point. Don? You mentioned Barley Carp. Do you have his quote that he, he had put together? It's something like, I, I, I'm sorry, I only have one life to give or something to that effect. But the thing he was, Maybe that was Nathan Hale. When, when they asked him about uh, giving up Christ, it, it, you know, denounce Christ and live. He says, he's been good to me for 70 years and I will not deny him. No, I do remember that now that you say that. That was Polycarp. What a, what a wonderful way to go, wasn't it? Yep, it's true. Give you some perspective. <clears throat> In a church building that holds 150 max, uh, two weeks ago in, in, uh, at the Freetown Church, we helped support the preacher there, there were 350. They literally were sitting on laps. <clears throat> they were outside windows. <clears throat> they were just stacked on top of one another. Their weekly contribution is $25. Are they rich? They are. They are. It's like the widow and the two mites. They do what they can do. They do the best that they can do. Sometimes you think about that and you're ashamed. Questions or comments on those? Those are really good, Don and uh, Greg. Anyone else? Okay. The church at Smyrna received praise from Jesus without a single word of censure. At least I couldn't find it. Nevertheless, there was a big problem about to confront them. What was that big problem? The Lord had nothing bad to say about Smyrna, only good. But he says, you're getting ready to face a big problem. What is it? More tribulation. More tribulation. You're going through it, it's going to get worse. More tribulation to the point where some of you will, will die. Revelation 2 and verse 10, lesson for you and me today. How long we got to be faithful? But Gary's getting old. Uh, he, he's been faithful long enough. No. Gary is getting old, but uh, <clears throat> you're faithful as long as you're alive. You have to be. There's no stopping. There's no retirement. Now, you slow down. We just slow down as we get older, but you got to keep on keeping on. Be faithful unto death, whatever that happens to be. Is persecution inevitable for Christians? Somebody said it better be. I like that. Um, someone turn to John 15 and verse 20, and then read that real loudly when you get there. John 15 and verse 20. This is Jesus himself talking. John 15 and verse 20. 
is persecution inevitable for Christians? Jesus says, Remember the world, remember the word I said to you. A slave is not greater than the master. Master, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Servant is not above his master. Was Jesus persecuted? Obviously, he was to the point of death. And he says, you're certainly not above me. And if I suffered and was persecuted and, yea, even was killed, then you need to be willing to do that as well. That's from the mouth of Jesus himself. All who live in godly will, what? Suffer persecution. It's true. Go to Romans 8, verses 35 through 39, and we'll, I was going to do, well, I'll still have time, I think. Go to Romans 8, verses, what did I say, 35 through 39. Romans 8, 35 through 39. Now, this is what can separate us from God. This is what can separate us from God, or what can't separate us from God. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted, accounted as sheep for the slaughter, yet in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What can separate us from Jesus? Well, there's one thing. You. You. Me. That's the only thing that can separate us from Jesus. He lists everything imaginable. Height, depth, he said, none of that can separate you from me. It cannot. It cannot. Now, when he says that, and I, and I want to close with this in verse 11. Go, I said I'd go back to it, and I will. <clears throat> he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He, over, he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Now, what is the second death? Lance, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, eternal separation from God. That's right. That's exactly right, brother. Uh, what's the first death then? It's what? Dying. Physical death. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. First death, second death. And then he talks about in Revelation 20, uh, verses 5 and 6, that there's a first resurrection from the dead. Now, what is that? That's a little bit of the trickier one. What is the first resurrection from the dead? I'll say yes to that. Um, baptism, and I have no problem with that because we, we're certainly, in Romans 6, we are... We are raised from the dead, and that, that, that's, a, that's a perfect answer. Um, Paul says in, in, in the book of Philippians that I'd rather die and be with Christ. Could that also be, or some say, actually some say that is the, that is the first resurrection. I lean toward this. I suspect that's right, but... Uh, in Luke 16, when the rich, when the uh, Lazarus died, where was he? Was he resurrected, so to speak, in Abraham's bosom, reigning with Jesus? He was. So could it have a double meaning? Maybe. Maybe. Don says no. Um, okay. I think I can prove that it actually was. If you want, we'll sit down. We'll talk about it. Okay. All righty. Questions, comments before we stop. So, so when Lazarus died, he was in the afterlife when they got pulled back when Christ raised him? Or? Uh, Jesus' friend Lazarus? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. 
Hades, Hadean realm, Luke 16, I think so. Yeah, because Hades is divided into two parts, the powers and paradise. Right. right, that's right. All right, thank you very much.